Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,304 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This is the seventh of ten message in our series covering the characters of Christmas. This message is titled, Seeking and Finding the Wise Men. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Well, after our blessed baptism service and service last week, it seems like time goes, continues to go by. And as I just mentioned to Paul this morning, it was only a week ago that we had that baptism. But it was such a blessed time. And I thank you for everyone that was here and everyone that participated with that. Um, these children, the young ladies, actually, um, making a public profession of their faith. And it was such a blessing to both to Paul and I also. And then last week, we did have our first message in Advent as we continued our studies of Christmas characters from last year. And we looked at the first to know who were the shepherds. And this week, we're going to go on a two-year caravan with a group of travelers from the east in a message titled, Seeking and Finding the Wise Men. Our passage today is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It's on page 1497 of your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. And this chapter is titled, The Magi, and Magi means wise men, visit the Messiah. So follow along. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is where the prophet is written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for this child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After, the king had, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east rose and went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, when you grow up in the church like Paul and I did, one of the enduring symbols of Christmas are those wise men and their camels. Every year, some of the larger churches in the big cities will have multi-day Christmas pageants. There'll be elaborate affairs with, complete with live animals, including camels and donkeys and sheep. And people of those church will ride, become those wise men and ride upon those camels. It's a grand affair. Those dressed in luxury, luxurious robes such as this one, this is a robe that I purchased to marry Janet, our daughter Janet and her son Rowan. And it's an authentic Indian robe, so it's from that area, the Middle Eastern countries. And it's a fancy one with fancy stitching on both sides. And they usually wore a little turban showing their wealth, the op opulence of their wealth. So picture in your mind a stately looking wise man sitting atop that camel as they rode into Bethlehem and singing their joy, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And then they arrive at the house where Mary, Joseph, and that toddler Jesus now lived. Yes, the wise men are a regular feature of our Christmas. They adorn our nativity sets. They appear on our Christmas cards. But what's funny about these wise men is we really don't know too much about them. Or more accurately, how much we probably get wrong about these mysterious monarchs. If you'll turn in your bulletin today, insert today, on the side, it says, the Magi visit the Messiah. 
I have four different areas where you want to look at today. But don't worry, I won't be the guy who spoils every Christmas by pointing out all the historical inaccuracies of our cherished Yuletide beliefs. Every gathering seems to have some sort of Scrooge-like character who has either graduated from seminary or is busy writing blog posts telling everyone that Christmas probably wasn't in December 20, on t December 25th. But I do think it's essential that we gain a little bit more understanding of these traveling sages. There's been a lot of speculation throughout all of church history, mainly because the Bible is somewhat vague about these details. Now, we get the word wise men translated into the English as a way of interpreting the Greek word magos. And it typically means something like those who have wisdom through investigation and interpretation of the movement of heavenly bodies. I'm glad they just said wise men instead of all that. Most likely, they were astronomers or possibly even astrologers. Matthew tells us they came from the east. Now, many have speculated they probably came from Persia, which is the modern-day Iraq. This would seem to make sense, though we cannot be sure. Many in the East were watchers of the stars and often used them for divining purposes, to, to pray to their gods of some sort of meaning and purpose. But they could have also been from Babylon. And think about this. That's where the Jewish exiles were taken. And the book of Daniel records about astronomers and astrologers in Daniel chapter 2, verses 2 and 10, to help the kings understand their visions and their dreams. So it's not hard to imagine somebody like Daniel, who rose to prominence within Babylon in the empires that followed Babylon, and he was outspoken about his faith for the, and belief in that Messiah, the coming Messiah. And he may have influenced several generations of Eastern intellectuals who had picked up and heard about Daniel and read some of his writings. And then the question is always, were there three of them? And were they really kings? As our famous hymn that we sang this morning, We Three Kings of Orient Are, it would seem to indicate there were three of them, but that's probably not the accuracy of it. Now we get the idea because of the three gifts that they have offered, which possibly was an entire delegation of wise men that presented their gifts as a whole. The delegation had these three types of gifts and they presented them to this infant Jesus. It's likely there was more than three, given how much of a stir that Matt caused in written in Matthew when they arrived in Jer Jerusalem. And one of the early church fathers speculated perhaps there was, might have been up to 14 wise men, plus their entire entourage who took care of them and came along with them. So it could have been dozens riding on their camels or walking or on donkeys, entering into Jerusalem that day, asking, where is he who is king of the Jews? And you know what that did to Herod's mindset. We don't really know how many there were. They probably weren't kings, but prominent influential religious leaders from the east. Think about the pre pre king priest type that wore these luxurious robes. So they might have looked like kings, although they were probably religious leaders. What is clear to us is the Magi were earnest in their desire to find the king of the Jews. They combined the knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures they must have gotten from somewhere, possibly Daniel, with the reliance on astronomy or astrology. Scripture speaks powerfully against looking to the stars as a sense of direction instead of God's word, we're not to do that. But utilizing the power of the heavenly bodies, God directed these wise men to his son. It doesn't mean that the Bible condones astrology. When we have God's word in completeness, we don't need anything else. But it does show how God is willing to meet us, those who genuinely seek him. Consider how God met us. I doubt that any of us were very sound in our theology when we first came to Christ. I know I wasn't. I've grown every year, learning more and more about him. And yet God is meeting those seeking sinners, some with impure motives and some with uncertain beliefs, in order to point our soul to the Son. 
And consider what tools God employed in his story here to announce to the world that his son was born. The entire universe was at God's behest to announce that gospel, not only in the night of his birth, but for this long trip that these wise men took. Last week in Luke, we read about the messengers in the sky that lit up with a heavenly host, a choir that proclaimed the birth of Christ. In Matthew, we read that the star pointed these wise men to the town of Bethlehem, to where the infant Christ child was now. This story is also connected to the Old Testament. There's an obscure story in Numbers chapter 22 through 24. It's about that ornery prophet of Balaam and his talking donkey. And God asked Balaam to deliver three blessings to his people. And one of those is a final message contained these words in Numbers chapter 24, verses 16 and 17. He says, The message of the one who hears the word of God, who has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob, and a scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. Somehow, we think it's a coincidence that this star might have appeared in the night. Some people say, well, it must have been a comet that led them. It could have been. But what we do know, there's no doubt that it was from God. He appeared as a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud leading his people of Israel throughout the wilderness. So for him to open up the heavens today, when these wise men followed that star, just to point them to the lost, to Jesus, it's not only of God, but it's how he announced his birth to these wise men. All creation it was, a God, was at God's disposal to tell a story. Even King David described the joy that this day would cause when the universe would announce that the son of David was going to be born in that city of David. In one of David's psalms, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 5 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God, and the skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voices is never, are never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made his home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like the great athlete eager to run his race. In the 19th century, British pastor Charles Spurgeon said this about the star that was leading those wise men. He says, he was born of lowly parents, laid in a manger, and wrapped in infant clothes. But the principalities and powers of the heavenly places are in motion. First, an angel descends to proclaim the advent of this newborn king. But the activity was not confined to the spirits above. For in the heavens above the earth, something began to stir. The star was sent on behalf of all the stars, as if it was an envoy for all the worlds to represent them before the king. This star was put into commission to wait for the Lord, to be a herald to these men far away, and to, usher God's, to be God's usher to conduct these wise men into Christ's presence. As many of you know, I'm a space fan. I love the study of the universe. I love sci-fi programs. I read sci-fi novels, space novels all the time. But this, thinking of this, gives me goosebumps to think about when this star first appeared in the heavens. For these sages of the East, this infant son of God, this creator of the heavens and the earth, who holds the universe in his own very hands, was directing that star to himself. This shows us the love of God has for the world. And Jesus would later say in John chapter 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Because in our own lives, not every day will be sunshine and roses. Some days may appear dreary and bleak for us. But know this, 
If you are in Christ, God has leveraged the entire universe to shout his message of love to draw you to himself. And that takes us to the next section about, indeed, there were kings in this passage. It might have not been the wise men who were kings, but there were kings in this passage. Because although we may not believe these wise men were actual kings, the singing in our song this morning is still okay, and it's one of my favorites. There are kings in this passage. And this, I believe, is the point of Matthew, including the story and the retelling of this birth of Jesus. Now, if Luke emphasizes Jesus as a servant, Matthew's gospel is all about Jesus as being the king. That's why he opens with an extensive genealogy in the first chapter, establishing Jesus as the rightful heir to the throne of David. And it's why Matthew contrasts Jesus, the king of kings, with Herod, the king of the Jews, that bloodthirsty ruler of the Jews appointed by Rome, Herod the Great. He was kept in power by attacking and often killing his political enemies and even those of his own family. He also built impressive architecture throughout all of Jerusalem and Israel. He even built or authorized the building of the second temple for the Jews. This prominent and wealthy men from the east, they traveled far and wide, not to sit at the throne of who was sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, but to bow down before an infant in a house in Bethlehem. The star from heaven didn't point to Herod, but it pointed to Jesus. You see, Matthew is telling us that true worshipers worship the true king. And while most of Israel slept in spiritual lethargy, and those who actually knew the scriptures, those scribes and those chief priests, they were more fearful of Herod than they were of God. The wise men had come in faith to worship the one who deserved to be worshiped, and that's Jesus Christ. The presence of these men from the east Think about it. These were outsiders. They were Gentiles. It's a confirmation that God promised to send the Messiah, not only to be king of the Jews, but the Messiah of all nations. Jesus' kingdom is not just for insiders, but also for outsiders. In fact, many insiders, those who were closest to Jesus, were most resistant to his message. And so it often is today. Those who have been most church throughout their lives are sometimes blinded by our own self-righteousness that we cannot see or will not see the good news and share it with others. It's often those who seem far away from God who God draws by his spirit to him. And this should give us pause to begin to think that the gospel is not only for people like us, that look like us, who live in a particular area, who speak the same language, who have the same background or similar backgrounds. No, the truth is that we as Western nations, we're likely the ones who originally were the outsiders when the gospel was first extended. We were part of those Gentile nations that were farthest from Jesus. And by God's grace and his blessings, he's blessed so many Western countries to receive the gospel and allow it to be worshipped and proclaimed freely. We should thank God for his promise that it wasn't only for a particular ethnic group, such as the nation of Israel, but that his kingdom, in his kingdom, we see every tribe, every nation, every tongue represented it. This is a global kingdom, which will make into a global Eden when Christ returns. So we need to be praying that our churches worldwide will begin to reflect heaven's reality. It's a beautiful diversity of the kingdom of God. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be represented and is represented within the body of Christ. It wasn't they knew in their Eastern religions. It wasn't they discovered in Jerusalem these wise men where they thought they would find the king of the Jews. They obviously thought if it was a king of the Jews, he would be in the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. But it wasn't even among the religious leaders of that day who Herod consulted to find out where this baby was to be born. 
Those leaders should have joined with this caravan of wise men in their quest to find Jesus, but they didn't. But this is an important point, because true wisdom they found is found, they realized, at the feet of Jesus, not in the throne palaces of the kings. Imagine the scene here in Bethlehem. As you're riding into Bethlehem with this entourage of these wise men, the scriptures tells us that after a fruitless inquiry of Herod's temple, the star once again rose in the east. And it appeared, leading them to the exact house where Mary, Joseph, and the now toddler Jesus lived. Jesus was, contrary to our nativity scenes and our Christmas pageants, not a baby when the Magi showed up. They were no, he was no longer in a cradle. And judging by Herod's murderous edict, which we're going to study next week, we can assume that Jesus was probably about two years old. But even though they missed his birth, it doesn't make this long journey of worship any less significant for these wise men. They had scanned the skies. They had poured through their ancient text, and they had plodded on the deserts to make way over the mountains, and they knocked on doors and, and tiptoed into temples. These men and their entourage that rode with them and walked with them and climbed the mountains on their way to Jerusalem into a home that was utterly foreign to them. This wasn't part of their culture. It wasn't part of their country. And yet these wise men's journey can journey pales compared to the one who they went to visit, the one that was now honored. Jesus had a much more extended trip than this. He left his throne in heaven and coming to live among his people. He tabernacled amongst us. He set us up his tent among us. He took on our flesh and our blood so that we might be redeemed and have open access to God. This is why the Magi's response was one of worship and exaltation of Christ. Let's stop and meditate here just for a moment. These were men of the world. They were wise. They were cultured. They were sophisticated men. They came expected to see a young king sitting on the throne with servants and the trappings of royalty all around him. But instead, they found a poor family in an otherwise quiet neighborhood. This was also ordinary, also average to those that might look upon the outside. Unfamiliar with these ancient prophets, those people that were right around the Christ child in Bethlehem. They were unaware of that guiding star that led these men from the east into Bethlehem. But those whose hearts were open to God's leading, who were genuinely seeking Jesus, who saw the prophets, what the prophets had predicted, what the angels had serenaded at his birth, and what Mary understood as she stood there, gazing upon her son, this toddler in a dirty tunic standing before her, was the very son of God. And so these prestigious men dropped everything. They offered everything in a proper response to Jesus, which was worship. The very sight is a bundle of contradictions. This young child was receiving worship from royalty. The wealthy were bowing down before the impoverished. But that was what the upside down nature of the kingdom of God is all about. Those who are lowest serving others. In a moment, the real power is not what the wealth has to offer. It's not what these rich rulers had to offer. It was not in the gilded halls of Herod's palace. The real wealth was in that God-man, Jesus Christ, that was standing before them. And so they bowed down in reverent and genuine worship. Now Jesus would later say, that was nearly impossible for people of means to enter into the kingdom of God in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. This is because money and power, like that possessed of these wise men, can become our idols and vulnerabilities to us, those who are in need 
of a saving faith. But Jesus would also say, with God, nothing is impossible in Matthew 19, 26. So here we have it, the wealthy, the connected, the influential people drawn by the Spirit of God into humility that causes us to be brought down low in worship, worship of the Almighty. They follow the star and now worship the one who actually hung the stars in space. In a sense, the journey that they had is not just for those Eastern wise men, those Magi, but for anybody who seeks the kingdom of God. God does resist the proud, and he says this several times in the Bible, but he dispenses grace to the humble. And regardless of your bank account size, whether you grow up on the streets or you grow up in a mansion, to know Jesus is to become low, to recognize our own sinfulness and our vulnerabilities, to receive God's grace. The Bible says that one day, everyone will be a worshiper of him. Even those who resist in this life will, at one point, worship him, but will it be too late. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But only the truly wise bow and worship him before it is, while we still have time. And that takes us to our last point today. Although salvation is free for all who accept Christ, our worship can be costly. This Christmas, we should linger and reflect on the depths of the worship exhibited by these wise men, these magi. Matthew includes a story to show us that the true worshipers of the king and we consider a fourfold response of these wise men. First, they sought. They sought the truth by following the star and reading the ancient prophecies. Next, they obeyed. They went before Christ, but they obeyed the angel's voice who told them not to return to Herod. They bowed down at the sight of Jesus. And they gave precious gifts in an act of devotion and worship. Theirs was not a cheap worship. It was not a casual event. It was a costly worship. And we need to guard ourselves against, guard our worship of Jesus on becoming too flippant in our religiously saturated culture. We need to sing on Sundays and every day with excitement in our hearts. We need to approach our weekly gatherings on Sundays with our saints with an eye of excitement and a heart full of joy. If Jesus is the true king, if he is the fulfillment of the covenant promises to Israel, if he is the light of the world to save the people from their sins, then he is worthy of our whole worship, our body, soul, and mind. And as with Magi, our journey is no less important today. Our worship is no less needed than that worship that the Magi did on that day that they met Christ. Today, God is calling us to worship together, to lift up our praises before him to the king of kings. The wise men offered a costly worship. These men gave lavish, expensive gifts. And there's been much speculation with, throughout the church history on the meaning of these gifts, but that's not the point of today's message. We can't really be dogmatic about these gifts, although we sang about them in our song this morning. But we can be sure that true worship involves giving. Giving is a natural overflow of our heart that is grateful to Jesus, who gave us everything. And the one reason why Christians, we resist the secularization of Christmas is because we don't want to become entrapped with all the glitz and glamour of it. But we can be joyful gift givers at this time of year. We give each other's gifts because it's celebrating the Lord's birth. Our king has come. Our joy has overflowed. And as we let our joy overflow, let it overflow into our hands, from our hearts to our hands and into the lives of other people. That is what we need to do this Christmas, to reflect, to meditate with joy overflowing into the lives of other people. Now, on the other side of your bulletin insert, I have included a Advent study reflections to take home and study this week. 
So if you have time this week, just spend a few moments going through that. And next week, we're going to continue our Advent message with the candle of joy. It's somewhat ironic, though, because next week's message is about the dark side of the Christmas characters, the dark side of the force. It's about Herod, that monster of Christmas, as we see what drove him mad with paranoia and passion. So please read Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23 in preparation for next week's message. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you that you led these wise sages to that house where infant Jesus lived, where he ran and he played, and he learned about you. We thank you that they presented their gifts out of a heart of love. As we meditate, as we reflect on this Christmas season, as we give gifts to one another, let us do so, so out of the heart of joy. Let us give into the hearts and lives of other people. Let us show forth the love that Jesus Christ has for us to everyone we meet. Let our hearts be full of joy and of gratitude. Let us sing excitedly the hymns of, the, of Christmas, Father, and let us just reflect on all that you did for us. Let us not neglect our mission, our passion, our worship of you as we ministered in the hearts of everyone else. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously. Lead with integrity and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.